So yesterday I made this. This is asaro, uh, Nigerian yam porridge with fish and peppers. This is cold because of this is some of the leftovers. I little had a little dig in there last night and ate some of it cold. It's actually quite a nice cold. But what was interesting is this is set. Now this is the starches that have gelled this, not the stock. The chicken stock was not that harder set but this is set into quite firm pieces so I'm wondering what happens now if we slice that and fry it is that going to melt or is that going to go crispy well as I often say the thing to do is stop wondering and try So over here, a little bit of oil in a pan, we'll get that good and hot. Okay, well, here we go. I think we'll just start with those three pieces, otherwise it could get awkward to turn them. But they don't appear to be melting. So that's interesting. Now, a lot of this is because the starch in, this, in these yams that this is made from behaves very differently to starch in potatoes. It, it was just a lot more fluffy and absorbent. And so I think what's happened is that as this is cooled, it's continued to absorb the moisture and lock it up. And so, I think, well, I think we're gonna have a saro fritters. Now, I don't know if that's already a thing in Nigeria. It might well be. I imagine if this works and shallow frying works here, then deep frying would also work and you'd get a crispy shell on the thing. So let's just try turning one of these and we'll see how it's doing. Yeah. Interesting. But I think we know the answer to the question now is yes, they do. Yes, it does fritter. And that's lovely and crisp on the outside there. That's, a, that's like a crispy shell. Now, one thing that might be quite difficult with this is that the thickness of it might mean that the middle is not completely worn through by the time the outside has gone crispy. So I am gonna recut one of these thick slices here into two thin slices. And we'll try that as well. That's not holding together quite so well, but I'll try frying these thin bits as well. This first batch, I think, is probably nearly ready to come out. And I could try standing on its edges and trying to fry all the edges. I'm just actually not going to bother with that. Let's get that out. We'll have a little bit more oil and then we'll see what it's like. Frying these thinner pieces. All right, well, they smell even more amazing than the Asaro did on its own. I think that just the frying has added something to those oils. And of course the fish as well, fried fish. It's got a thing about it as well. So, firm enough to eat with a fork now. Hmm. So, that's like a spicy fish cake now. And that's really, really good. Absolutely superb. Now I'm not gonna say that's necessarily better than eating asaro as a porridge. Obviously that, because it was just filling and lovely and soft and warm and steamy. And so that had a real comfort angle to it, but this is good. Just that little bit of crisping and frying has really brought out the fried fish flavor and it's really good. So yeah, I'll be very surprised if this is not something that already happens, if there is such a thing as leftover asaro in Nigeria and I think it's Nigeria and some other African countries, actually. So yeah, I'd be very surprised if they hadn't already figured this out. So it doesn't exactly stay crispy, but it does get a kind of bark on it. And the inside does warm up on these thicker slices, so I didn't need to do those thin ones. However, for the sake of completeness, we will see what these thin ones have gone like. I don't think there's really much reason to do it as thin as that. It breaks up. So I think maybe the, that's about just over a centimetre thick. 
those slices. Mm. Actually, that's gone softer. Oddly enough, that's gone soft. I think because the heat has got all the way through it, and so the, the inside has melted a little bit. The thicker slices are definitely better. So, Asaro fritters, really good. As soon as I finished eating this, I'm gonna text Babatunde and find out if this is a thing they already do over there. And the answer is here. Okay, I don't know if you remember this. This is some crow garlic that I foraged back in February and chopped up and froze. This is little frozen pieces of crow garlic. Similar to chives, I found it really difficult to describe the flavour, but I'm going to have another go today. So we're going to cook something really simple that brings out the flavour of this crow garlic. I'm just going to make an omelette with a bit of cheese and chilli and crow garlic. This is just a long red chilli. They've got a little bit of fire to them, but they are fairly mild. I'm just going to shred that up into nice thin slices. I'm going to keep the seeds and pith in. As I say, they're quite mild. Now at times in the background of this video, you might be able to hear a little bit of humming noise. My neighbor's having a hedge taken down and they've got a wood chipper going. So just in case you're wondering what that sound is, if you can hear it, that is what that is. Anyway, three large eggs, and we are gonna season these eggs. So a little bit of salt, not a little bit of black pepper. Salt will affect the texture of these eggs. It will loosen up the proteins a little bit. So we should end up with a more evenly textured omelet. Right, okay, over to the cooker now. Now this will all proceed quite swiftly. So I've got all of my ingredients ready. So a bit of butter in a pan, and also a tiny bit of olive oil because I like it. And we'll just get that up to temperature. So now that butter is foaming, turn down the heat a little bit, and in with the egg mix. And also I'm gonna have about a tablespoonful of this crow garlic. Before that cooks too much, just going to incorporate that crow garlic into the egg. And I'm going to stop right there, not scramble that anymore because obviously that now needs to set as an omelette. I've got my red chilli. Break up that little bit. And then I've got some grated mature cheddar cheese. A classic French omelette is very, very lightly cooked and would not have any browning at all on it. I do like a little bit of browning on my omelette though. So, we're not making a classic French omelette today. Before this is completely set, I'm just gonna flip that over. And the same there. And we'll just cook it a little bit longer on that side. Meanwhile, there is just time for me to dash to the freezer and put these back in. And then we're going to flip this over. I think I'm going to try and do that. I was going to try and flip that with a toss of the pan. But I think it might be a little bit too delicate for that. So Mechanical assistance. I'm going to cook this so the inside of the omelette is a little bit kind of saucy. The eggs will still be quite tender in there. The eggs in the UK are generally safe to eat raw unless you have a weakened immune system or any other reason, but eggs generally in the UK are safe to eat raw, so I can quite happily eat this omelette with a tender, kind of saucy inside. It'll still be hot, it'll still be cooked, it just won't be set like rubber. Okay, right, that's time to serve. I would say I might have gone a little bit further than I intended to there with the cooking. Let's have a look inside. So, so yeah, actually, no, that's fine. So we've still got a kind of melty, some of that is melted cheese, some of that is soft egg. Obviously, if you like your omelettes done a bit longer than that, then more power to you. Do it the way you like it. So there we go. Crow garlic cheese and chili omelette. It's very good. So let's try to describe the flavor of this crow garlic. Bearing in mind descriptive terms for flavour are always a bit difficult. So it is kind of oniony garlicky, but it is distinct from regular onions and garlic. It's different from those things. I like to describe that as being different from onions and garlic by the same amount that those are different from each other. So if you think about an equilateral triangle with onions and garlic on two of the corners, crow garlic is off on the third corner. 
Now I realize that doesn't really tell you what it tastes like, only that it's different. Because it's obviously green leafy parts, it has got a sort of fresh green vegetable leafiness to it. But part of the onion flavor is a really deep savory umami flavor, like you would get from Marmite or crispy bacon or crispy chicken skin. That kind of savory, but not salty flavor. Crow garlic has got some of that of its own. It's just a really nice wild vegetable and different enough that it's worth seeking out. And actually the combination together with chilies and cheese and egg works really well. Someone in the comments of the previous video did describe it as being like a mixture of onions and mushrooms. And though I wouldn't have thought of that myself, I can see where they were going with that. So it has that kind of depth of savory flavor that you get from mushrooms alongside an oniony, garlicky flavor as well. So yeah, that's possibly the same thing that I was trying to describe as meaty. Yet again, I've tried and failed to describe the flavor of this delicious wild vegetable. I think really the only way to experience flavors is to do it firsthand. Me describing flavors to you in words just isn't ever gonna work properly. However, that was a tasty omelet. I have this rock that I picked up at Lyme Regis when I was there with Jenny doing the precious pottery pickup video. I believe there's a fossil in the middle of this one. You might not be able to see it very clearly at the moment, but let me just get that wet. So we've got a dark colored rock with this light colored line running through it. And there's a kind of almost stitched appearance to these, to this layer here. And I believe that indicates a fossil in the middle of this rock. Candidates in my imagination for what this fossil might be is an ammonite. That could be the ridges on a shell of an ammonite. Or that could be the ridges on a shell of a bivalve, something like a cockle or a scallop. So we're going to try and break this in half. Now, my initial thoughts were, I try and do that gently by freezing and thawing it and hopefully letting the water get in there and expand when it freezes and push it apart. So let's just have a quick look at how that went. So we've got this frozen rock. This is day two, by the way. Someone suggested on the preview of the video to pour boiling water over it, and that does sound like it could be a productive idea. So I've got it here in the sink. I've just boiled the kettle. I'm going to heat it with just by pouring a whole kettle full of boiling water over it. The idea being to give it a bit of thermal shock, heat up the outside while the inside is still cold. It was a good idea. It is hot now, actually. That doesn't appear to have made any difference, but it was a fine idea. Anyway, I'm gonna soak this again and then put it back in the freezer and we'll try again tomorrow. So once again, we're thawing with hot water, this time from the tap. It's actually quite hot. It does not seem to be making any difference. So I don't think this, this freeze-thaw thing is working, or at least maybe it would, but not within my lifetime. So yeah, it doesn't look like freezing it is gonna work. So now we take it outside and try a bit of percussive maintenance. To serve as my anvil today, we've got a piece of old railway track that we found in the garden when we are digging up stuff. I'm just gonna place this on here and tap it a few times with a hammer. I was gonna try and use a chisel, but I think we'll just tap it gently and see what happens. To stop it rolling around while I'm doing that, we'll apply a little bit of cushioning, really just to stop it slipping around, and some semblance of protection to my fingers with a leather glove. Also, eye protection. Here we go. Okay. Now, well, it's broken, but not exactly how I hoped it would. And. Yeah, inside there's kind of nothing. Well, that's disappointing. I really did expect that we might find an ammonite in there, but I have a feeling that what we've really got is just a little layer of calcite or something in the middle. It's quite sparkly. No real evidence of a fossil. I'll give it a little scrub. I think maybe there might have been a shell or something at some point, but there's nothing there. There is a kind of radial look to some of the things here. I don't know if it's showing on camera. It looks like maybe this was just 
the formation of calcite crystals and maybe there was some sort of radi radiating pattern to that and that's what caused those ridges at the edge. Well, mild disappointment. Now you can see something when I tilt it there, you can see there's a kind of wavy pattern but that doesn't look like any fossil that I recognise. Even when I wet it to improve the contrast there, well, yeah, that might have been a bit of a shell in the middle, but it's not a quality fossil. Slight disappointment, but you know, we had to try. Okay, it's the 1st of March and we've got some planting to do. We're gonna plant shallots and some more broad beans. We've got the winter broad beans that we put in here. We're gonna put some spring broad beans in that end of the plot. And I think the shallots will go at the back end of this one. Okay, this is a mixed bag of shallots. I'm just gonna tip them all out here for the moment. Instructions on here say three centimeters deep, 12 centimeters apart. So I think I'll space them out first. So it's gonna be something like that. And yeah, this is a mixed bag, so it's got some red ones in here, different shapes, red, yellow, white. <laughs> Eva's telling the rooks off. So I've got to dig holes for these and put them just below the surface. So only two hands for that bit. Right, so we put the green netting round then. Yeah. We just need to remember that we planted up to, well, we need a cane or something to mark where we planted up to. Right. So this part of the raised bed here hasn't had any uh, fertiliser on it since last year. So last year we put a load of manure on here and then grew beans on this plot. And this hasn't had any additional compost added. Onions don't always like too much compost. If they're given too much fertilizer, they can tend to bolt and produce flowers rather than bulbs. And that's not really ideal because the bulbs that have bolted don't always store very well. So, the plan here is just to leave the soil as it is and then when the onions are finished we'll plant something else in here but we'll get some more fertilizer on next year because next year it will be courgettes on this plot because we're doing a kind of version of crop rotation not so much to eliminate diseases which is one of the reasons for crop rotation but rather to have the appropriate level of fertilizer for the plants were planting. Right, so that's good. So that's shallots up to that line there. So we've got all of this bit to plant something else. Okay, and then we just put this netting around here. This will keep the cats and the dog off and we might have to put some twigs over there to stop the birds coming in and pulling the onions up when they come up. Summer broad beans are gonna be in this patch here and we'll leave ourselves a little patch at the end here for runner beans. So broad beans are gonna go in here and the instructions here are five centimeters deep with 23 to 30 centimeters between plants but we're just going to go for the same spacing we've had here often the spacing recommended is not is a bit more generous than they really need so that's what the seeds look like basically dried up beans so if i take about half of them and you've got half that side if, if you go up to there that middle line yeah and I'll plant on this side and I reckon we're stopping about here so I reckon we're planting in that that square okay, I'm going to plant closer together than the packet says actually so it's always a bit too oh gosh, yeah. Woo, woo, woo. 
Oh, what? shut up, Eva. Okay, so yeah, I have kind of violated the spacing a little bit here, but it won't matter. These plants will do okay. And then we're up to that line there. I've got space over here if you want them. I'll put another one in there. Okay. And again, I'll get another stick to mark where we're up to. Okay, so we're up to there. And then this end bit here will have some runner beans in. They don't take up a lot of ground space because they go upwards. Right, so we just put another hoop in here and we'll extend this netting across to that bit just to keep birds off because certainly when these shoots come up, pigeons will pull them out. Time for a little bit more planting and today we're going to plant some Swiss chard. This is a relative of petrol spinach and in fact a descendant of sea beet but grown for its kind of edible brightly coloured leaves and stalks and I'm going to grow it in this little plot here by the greenhouse. This is what the raised bed that didn't do very well last year and I think that was a combination of factors. I, I think I grew the wrong thing. I tried growing some cow peas and black eyed beans and they just didn't do very well. And I think that was probably climate and all sorts of things. But anyway, it is the right time of year to be sowing Swiss chard. So that's what the seed capsules look like. Little kind of weird, bumpy, corky things. And these are adapted to float in water. So they're kind of like a lightweight nature to them. And that's because this plant is descended from a coastal plant so the idea is these seed capsules in the wild would fall off perhaps get blown into the sea carried away by the tides and currents wash up somewhere else dry out blow up shore a little bit and grow in a different part of a different beach anyway i'm going to be planting them here and it says to plant them it says to sow them thinly in drills which is another word for shallow trenches. I'm just going to grow one little line of them across the back of this border here because I think Jenny wants to grow some lettuces in the front. So sowing them thinly is actually quite difficult because they really just want to all come out at once. So we are going to have a little bit of clustering and stuff there. That's probably enough to get to be going on with. And it says to, to sow them one centimetre deep, which is almost no depth at all, basically. So I'm just going to agitate the surface of the soil just to work them in like that. They don't want to be buried deeply, but they need to be enough covered up that the rain isn't just going to splash them out of the border. So those are sowed. I don't think I even need to water those because we've got more rain predicted. So I'm just going to leave those as they are, but I think I'll cover this bed with a bit of netting to keep the birds off. Okay, so that'll do it for now. That will just be enough to keep pigeons off of there and stop them uprooting the sprouts when those plants come up. And here inside the upstairs greenhouse, this compost that I put on, you can see soil coming up through it now. So the worms have started to take that down and mix it in. I'm just going to keep it moist and just give it a little water every couple of days that's really as much to keep the compost moist as it is to keep the soil underneath moist because that moisture will help this compost to break down and start becoming nutrients in the soil but also it'll keep the worms alive and the worms are doing the digging for me and jenny spotted the other day these are my hascaps my flowering blue honeysuckle berries i planted two of them i planted two different varieties one here one here so that they will cross pollinate because without that cross pollination they don't set fruit very well so i've got two different varieties of house gaps there and hopefully i'm not sure we'll get any fruit at all off them this year actually they're really only just getting established they've got their roots down now i'm expecting that this year will be vegetative growth so we'll get some size on these bushes and then maybe next year we'll actually get some fruit off them but but we might be lucky we might get one or two little berries on there just to give us a taste. This is my Saskatoon berry tree, or it will be a tree. I'm not sure you can see it, you might see it better if I move around a little bit. Lots and lots of growth on there, lots of buds. Those look like flower buds, but they can't be, they must be leaf buds. 
but again I'm hoping this will put on some growth this year and start becoming a tree, a small tree. The loquat seems to be doing okay, it's lost a few of its leaves after transplanting but these buds are looking nice and healthy so we should get some more growth on there this year. People did ask whether this was a sensible place to plant the loquat and it's possible that it will outgrow this spot although before this was here there was a seedling from this evergreen oak, this holm oak. There was a seedling, it wasn't really a seedling, it was, it was a tree that was growing here before and it was an enormous bush. It went to above the height of the roof of this building here. We dug that out because it was starting to encroach the path. I don't think the loquat will do that because this isn't really quite the right climate for this plant so the frost will probably keep it under control. I have got one more planting space around about here somewhere and I've got one more thing to plant in there for our kind of fruiting hedge, fruiting berry walkway and that's this. This plant here is called Fajoa celoiana. This is the pineapple guava and it's not exactly a guava, it's a relative of guavas. It's in the myrtle family. It has green egg shaped and egg sized fruits on it when it's mature and I've deliberately bought one that was a decent size actually because I can't be bothered waiting 10 years for it to come to fruiting size. So this will have white and red flowers, very pretty white and red flowers in early summer and then in late summer it should have these green tropical tasting fruits on it. This plant is hardy in the UK and it should fruit here. So that one's going to go to this space here, so between the loquat over there and the Saskatoon berry, there's space for another, it'll be a large bush rather than a tree, and that'll go just about here. So I'll probably plant that this afternoon. So that's the root ball of this pineapple guava, and that's actually quite pot bound, so I am going to just break up the bottom of that a little bit. I don't think it makes an awful lot of difference but people say you should just to stimulate a bit of outward growth with these roots the thing is if you pull it apart too much you're just damaging roots anyway but there is a bit of folklore that says the roots will just continue growing around and around circles I'm not really sure that's very true actually I think they will spread out once they realize that there's some nice soil to get into down there as before some feathers in the bottom of the hole that will break down over time and feed the plant with mostly nitrates but I put a little bit of bone meal in there as well because I think this plant was going to need a fair bit of feeding. Right let's get that in the hole. So there's space enough between that and the loquat there and between that and the Saskatoon berry which will fill out this space here and grow up a bit as well. It looks a bit wonky at the moment but I think it will straighten up once it gets into place. I did plant the pot straight, but I think it wanted to grow. To, it probably is accustomed to the light being on the other side, but it will sort itself out. As before, I'm going to give it a good puddle in. I really did water, which will help. To, you can see the soil is getting washed there. This slurry of soil will wash down into any gaps or voids and that will help to settle it in. So yeah, once that settles in, hopefully it might even flower and fruit this year, if we're lucky. This plant won't grow as big as some of the other things here. It'll probably get twice this height, but certainly won't get more than twice this height. It will tend to be a bush. And maybe if this turns out to be a really tasty fruit, I might take some hardwood cuttings and grow some more of them elsewhere. I was given this on air light by a friend who ran a local radio station a number of years ago and was clearing out his attic and wanted to get rid of some of the equipment that he used for that radio station. So this is a proper official on air light. Looks like it's taken a little bit of damage here and there. But we're going to have a look at this today, take it apart, because this isn't just a thing, I mean it has got Let's have a look if we can take this cover off. Yeah, so we can take this cover off. It has got light bulbs in it, but it isn't just a light bulb. Two light bulbs for redundancy, so if one of them goes, you've still got a working light. 
and on the far end of quite a long cable there's a three pin plug, a mains plug, but there's also an XLR cable that runs into it. So there are two cables that run into the back here. And that's because this would have been controlled from a studio desk or something like that. So in a no, this is this is obviously something added, but the studio desk would have a switch or a control on it so that when you are broadcasting, your on-air light would automatically come on or could be controlled at least from the desk where you're broadcasting. Anyway. Yeah, we're going to open this up today and see what's inside. I'm not actually very sure how this all goes together. It looks like we are going to have to take these bulbs out there. I can't actually see how that's meant to come off. Well, it's all very curious, but anyway, it's powered down, so there's no risk of harm to life and limb. We'll open it up and have a look. I suppose the most obvious thing to do is undo these four screws here and see what happens and see if this front plate comes off. Now, my reason for opening this up is, well, twofold. Curiosity, obviously, I'm interested to see what's inside of here. There's obviously some kind of switching gear in here because you wouldn't just switch 240 volts via that XLR cable. Oh, good, that does come out, okay. Let's get all of those screws off to one side. Right, so, interesting. There's a connector block there, which we'll just undo, which should enable those wires to come out. And then similarly, there is another connector block here, which has got red and white. So white nearest the bottom. So I think we'll just undo that too because that bit's not so interesting. That's just the chassis with the cables. This is the bit that's interesting. So that's a bit more complex than I expected to find on there, actually. So I expected maybe we'd, we'd find a relay or something like that. And what's curious here is these four integrated circuits here. I can't quite understand what's, what would be the requirement of this much electronics for something that's basically just a switch on and off. There are some jumper switches here, so there's some kind of settings. Just looking at that hole in the case, which I originally thought was broken out, it does look a little bit more deliberate. It looks like maybe somebody cut that hole. Perhaps that was originally what mounted to a wall and the cable entry was over here. Anyway, the other thing I'm gonna do here now is take off this board off the back here, this hanging board. There are lots and lots of little screws rather more I suspect than are strictly necessary but we'll have all these little screws out of here we'll take this this case off of this board because on the back of the board there's also that junction box I don't think there's actually very much inside of it but we'll see how many have we got here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven these go to eleven Anyway, that's not the interesting part. Okay, well, I've looked up the part number for this on Canford Audio. This is actually discontinued, this unit, but that's not surprising to me. And I've had a look at all these different components. I think I can more or less figure out what's going on here. So this over here is the input from the three pin XLR lead. We've got a power input here, but then we've also got power output to the bulbs. So. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. So the power, even though it's all bundled up, the neutral goes straight to the lamps. And then we've got, I think that's probably just a smoothing capacitor. This is a paper capacitor here. In fact, it's a, it's a package, I think, with two different capacitors inside of it. We've then got a transformer. This is a step-down transformer, stepping down 240 volts AC down to some lower voltage AC. Don't know what the specification is. I can't actually see the writing on it here because it's obscured by this capacitor here. A full bridge rectifier, which is turning the AC into, well, lumpy DC. And then presumably these these other, these capacitors and other components here are to smooth that out into more or less a smooth DC supply for this bit here, which is the logic. Now, I was just wondering why on earth there would be logic on board something as simple as a light. 
But it turns out with these jumper settings here, you can set this to flash or be steady. So there are three input pins, and then if you short common to one of them, the light goes on and stays constant. If you short common to the other one of them, then what happens is it flashes and the flashing rate is programmable using these jumpers. You can have it on fast flash, slow flash, and you can change the off and on time. So the duty cycle of the on versus off time of the flashing lamp is somewhat programmable by these jumper connectors here. So anyway, so that's all the logic there. This logic here comprises, let's have a look, a couple of NAND gate packages. These are chips that have got a couple of NAND gates inside each one of them. Six channel inverter, so that's basically a NOT gate, but a bunch of NOT gates, and then a dual binary counter. And so this is just a little binary counter, and I presume that's what they're using to make it flash. And so that's probably just counting up. And then this other logic here is turning that counting into various different square waveforms which I assume are being selected or perhaps just programmed by these jumpers. Not going to try to do a complete uh, reverse engineer of this. This is the part that makes it flash and it needs that much logic there to be able to flash at different rates with different intervals. These are a couple of resistor arrays which I suspect are probably something to do with the durations. So these are different resistors and it may well be actually that these jumpers are switching in different banks of resistors to this to the little oscillator circuit, which they've probably got in here somewhere. There's a couple of capacitors, a diode, a couple of resistors. There's probably a little oscillator just here that's driving this logic. And yeah, these jumper switches here probably just switch in different banks or amounts of these resistors in these resistor arrays to change the clock speed. So we've got Power comes in on this top side and gets turned into DC. A little bit to make it flash here. The output of all of that goes through to here. And here we've got a NAND buffer. So this little NAND buffer here, I think, is probably making the decision between whether it's whether we've selected constant or flashing. And so that's either switching in the output of this oscillator or just switching it straight on. That goes into an optocoupler. And so this is the point here on the circuit board where we go from low voltage back into high voltage. So there's an optocoupler there. Some kind of transistor type thing there, possibly a MOSFET, possibly a TRIAC, something like that, which enables you to switch high voltages with low voltages. And then this is a power filter. So this is probably smoothing out the spikes and bumps that happen when you use a a square wave to switch a mains voltage on and off. And then that goes back to here, which is the live output. So that's the switched live output that goes off to the other side of the bulbs. So that's what the circuit does. As I say, I'm not going to completely reverse engineer that, but I'm pretty confident that's a reasonably accurate description of what all this stuff does. I don't need all of that. So actually, I'm probably just going to dispose of this. I might see if I can sell it, actually. There might be somebody looking for a spare part. And I'm probably only really interested in the plastics, which is kind of handy because this would be the hardest bit to recycle. So reuse is probably preferable. And I'm just going to put some LED lighting inside of there, a little switch on it somewhere. Possibly I'll reuse that hole there. Now this hole here, I think is one that somebody's cut in it and they've daisy chained these. Probably this is a second hand unit. And so I reckon they had probably, probably two of these lights. One of them had the control coming in from the switching desk and then there was probably another cable that, that daisy chained that out to another light using the same switching so they both came on and both did the same thing. Anyway, as I say, interestingly I looked on Canford Audio and th this shroud, this illuminatable red shroud was available in several different designs. This is I think silk screened on here, you could have on air, silence please, meeting in progress, or you could get blank ones that you would put your own lettering or iconography on there if you wanted to. That's going to be the piece I probably keep. I might put that on the wall of my studio just as a piece of decoration more than anything else. And just the other part which we looked at earlier, this box that was on the back of the board that had mounted it, the purpose of this was just strain relief really. So you've got the signal cable coming in there from the 
switching desk, actually two, only two of the conductors are there. So the dual mode flashing or steady of this wasn't in use in this implementation. And again, the mains cable comes in there with some cable glands there just for strain relief. So this box was on the back there just so that these cables didn't get tugged and damage the comparatively delicate plastics of this back panel. Anyway, so that was my kind of tear down and informal analysis of this on-air light that a friend gave me. That's probably about as far as we're going to take that for today. It's time for the comment positivity section. This is where I'm just going to pick out half a dozen comments or so that made me happy or made me smile, asked interesting questions, that sort of thing. We're going to celebrate the positive comments here. So starting, <laughs> starting with one <laughs> Lincoln Imp Nutcracker. Do you know what? I was just on the verge of saying, what did you call me? And <laughs> I thought, I'd better Google that. And uh, it turns out Lincoln Imp Nutcracker. The Lincoln Imp is a character. And it's because I was walking around Dorchester Market and I saw, and on one of the antiques stalls, there was a Nutcracker with an effigy of the Lincoln Imp on it. I didn't even know what the Lincoln Imp was, actually. So I went and looked it up. And this is from the Visit Lincoln website. It says, legend has it that one day the devil was in a frolicsome mood and sent two naughty creatures to cause mischief on earth. After allegedly stopping at Chesterfield, twisting the spire of St. Mary and All Saints Church, I think that's there is a church there with a twisted spire, the two imps went to Lincoln to wreak havoc in the city's cathedral. Upon arriving, the naughty imps went inside the cathedral and started to cause mayhem, knocking over the dean, smashing the stained glass windows and destroying the lights. In a bid to put a stop to their antics, an angel was sent to warn the imps off, causing any more chaos. One of the imps hid underneath the table, whilst the other started throwing stones and rocks at the angel in a final act of defiance. Stop me if you can, it cheekily retorted. In a moment of anger, the angel turned the imp to stone. He has remained in the same spot ever since, sitting cross-legged on the top of the pillar overlooking the angel choir, a constant reminder of how good will always triumph over evil. And apparently the other imp, which was not turned to stone, is responsible for the fact that it's often windy outside Lincoln Cathedral, and this is said to be caused by the second imp waiting for his friend to return. So funny little story there, but yeah, Lincoln Imp Nutcracker. So that was a Nutcracker with a picture of the Lincoln Imp on it. Okay, next one. Mike, do you get many people wanting to say hi because they recognise you when you're out and about? Uh, it does happen from time to time. I think sometimes maybe they recognise the shirt before they recognise my face, uh, or possibly recognise the dog before they recognise me. But yeah, it happens from time to time. And so yeah, I bumped into somebody in the supermarket the other day and we stopped and had a nice little chat and that was lovely. And I, the other thing I do get a lot of is that kind of look of recognition where I think somebody's probably realised that it's me or maybe recognise my face and can't remember where they saw it, actually, and then is too shy to come and say hello. So, you know, I don't mind if you do see me out and about. I don't mind if you pop up and say hi. If it looks like I'm recording, maybe wait until I've finished that little segment. Um, but anyway, yeah, I don't mind if you come and say hello to me if you do happen to see me out and about. Quick interruption from Studio Shrimp here. I also, of course, don't mind if you completely ignore me. If you don't want to come and say hello, you're under no obligation to give me the time of day. Okay, onward. Really insightful comment here about the jam tasting. So I tasted some cheap and some middle range and some expensive jams. And at the end of it, I found it actually quite difficult to figure out whether it is worth spending the extra money for the extra flavour. There certainly was a correlation between taste and price, but whether it's worth it or not was a difficult thing to quantify. And here's a really helpful comment about that. So someone said, for whether it's worth buying the more expensive, I don't think the ratio in price is all that important. The absolute difference is what matters, and you can work it out by serving. E.g. if one serving of jam is 20 grams, which is just the first result I got off the internet, then a serving of tip tree costs 26 pence more than a serving of Sainsbury's. The question is just whether the nicer jam eating experience is worth 26 pence. For me, I think it almost always would be, but of course it depends on how much money you have available, what else you'd be doing with the money, and how much you like the jams. And I just found that a really insightful way of actually breaking that down, to just say, okay, it's not about is this jam worth the total price? It's, it's, is this portion of jam worth 26 pence extra? Is this worth 26 pence to me in the moment of eating jam? Really good, I thought. The other comment they said is actually, you could also imagine if the tip tree was the price it is and the Sainsbury's was given away free, 
then the absolute price per serving difference would be 30 pence. But it would be impossible to calculate a ratio, but there would still be a market for the tip tree. There would still be a market for the one you have to pay for, even if the cheap one was free. I just found that a really useful way to think of that, actually, and I will apply that in my next cross-price tasting video. I have got another one planned. Uh, this was in a thread about my things that I'm planting in the garden, which was my Saskatoons and my Hascaps. So there was a thread about that saying, somebody said good choice on that, which is great. I have both in my yard in Alberta. Saskatoons grow near rivers in the wild. Hascaps need another Hascap of a variety, different variety to make more berries. Which, well, as you saw earlier in the video, perhaps, I've planted two different varieties next to each other. So hopefully that will enable them to fruit. Then I talked about, I was thinking about getting a pawpaw, an American pawpaw, which is Asimina or Asimina triloba. And it's a very tropical looking fruit, big, great, big, sort of fleshy, banana, tropical flavoured fruit. It grows in temperate climates though. Actually, I said one of the things that's putting me off trying that is that I thought the plants had separate male and female flowers on different plants which would be a problem because this is like one of these problems in mathematics. If there's two different things and you're picking them randomly, how do you make sure you've got some of each? And really the only way you'd be able to do that is just plant a lot of them and then hope that you hadn't got all of the same sex plants. But it turns out I was wrong about those plants. So somebody chipped in and said, Asimina triloba is protogynous and self-incompatible. So protogynous means hermaphrodite. It's got both male and female parts on the same flower, just at different times on the same tree. And self-incompatible, that's a quite common thing in botany, where a plant has both male and female parts on the same plant, but it can't be fertilized by its own pollen. Sometimes that's just because it produces pollen before the female parts are receptive. Sometimes that's actually a chemical or hormonal or genetic incompatibility that it will not pollinate itself. Primroses, I think, are a really interesting example of that. Primroses are, have both male and female parts on the same flowers, but they arrange them differently. And so some, some plants have got the pollen sticking out and the female parts at the back. Other plants have got the female parts sticking out and the pollen at the back. And so the bees visiting one flower will get pollen on part of their anatomy, which, which can't be passed to another flower of the same plant because, it's because of the arrangement of the parts. But the plant with the opposite parts, it, the pollen is in the right place to be deposited. Anyway, so they went on. The big problem is bees avoid the blossoms. They're pollinated by carrion flies and beetles, which actually, when you look at the flowers, I'll put a picture of the Asimina triloba, the American pawpaw flowers up on the screen. You can see why flies and beetles are attracted to that. It looks like a piece of meat. Um, and flowers that are adapted to be pollinated by flies often look like a dead thing or a piece of meat. So anyway, there, there's quite a lot of information here about how people have tried to adapt to that and they've got various programs and there are other species that are pollinated in different ways. I won't read all of that out now, but that was really interesting and useful information. Thank you for that. That's made me a little bit more confident about planting this plant. I think it's going to be okay because I'm out here in the countryside and we have got quite a decent population of, of carrion eating flies out here, of flies that are attracted to all sorts of dead things. Probably by virtue of the fact that we've got things like fungi, like stinkhorns, which will exploit flies. And yeah, there are enough dead animals outside in the woods and you know around the place that, um, that we should have enough flies to pollinate them. So I'm gonna get hold of some, I think I'm probably gonna have to grow that from seed, but I think it's a fairly fast growing tree. So I will get some of those and I'm gonna try and plant them probably on the edge of the woods here. So I don't wanna plant anything non-native too far into the woods, but on the perimeter of the woods here, between the woods and the garden, I'm happy enough to plant non-native plants. Anyway, so yeah, watch this space. I'm gonna try and do that. I think I can order some seeds and I think they're chilled. They need stratifying and then they can be germinated. Okay, next one. Good to see the splint and bandage off your little finger, Mike. Be well. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, little finger is healing. It's still a bit weird and wonky and I've still got exercises I've got to do. It's expected that that's going to heal. That might take six months to heal and it might never completely be right, but it's good enough to use now. So yeah, it aches a bit when it rains. I think that's probably something I'm going to have to live with. And then finally, this is just really a massive thank you to everyone who comments to appreciate various little details in the videos. Perhaps details I haven't pointed out or noticed myself. I do try to read all of your comments, although sometimes it's quite hard to keep up. 
but as a person who loves to notice and appreciate the little things, it, it makes me really happy when I see other people also noticing and appreciating and loving the little details. So that's all for this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.